Anyway, I better, as I said, stop rabbiting on and we'll introduce our first speaker for this afternoon's session, uh, Paul McKen McKenzie from Agrarian Management, to talk about uh, whether agriculture can double production by the year 2050 and the opportunities and limiting factors. There was a whole bio here of Paul and he said, don't worry about all that, that's boring, just tell my wife to catch mackerel. So, <laughs> I'm not sure where he is, but a man who likes to catch mackerel, Paul. Uh, Paul McKenzie, if you come up. something in the air, that there is change afoot, that people are beginning to understand the serious issues ahead. Certainly from this morning's session, I believe that is the case. According to the UN, the 7 billionth person will be born on October the 31st, so only, not even a month away, and the 8 to 10 billionth, circa 2050. <coughs> Welcome to the Anthropocene, which is the age of man. Did you enjoy your lunch? Today we're going to explore whether it's possible to provide food for such an extraordinary number of humans. I believe it is possible, but as was highlighted numerous times this morning, we are seriously exposed to risk. I have three main points for you. Outline the task ahead in the context of the last 200 years, the risks in particular population and diversity, and the opportunities, technology, science, an example of some cutting edge Western Australian broad acre research and raise the greatest opportunity that is within your very own hands. Now, let's get started. The last 200 years, until about 1800, like animals, mankind lived within limits constrained by food supply and disease. The Industrial Revolution saw an exponential increase in energy use, which caused widespread deforestation. The age of sale, in fact, was caused by the search for timber, for energy and for construction. Then oil-based oil hydrocarbons allowed for another surge in energy use and food supply, which caused a substantial <coughs> increase in scientific progress and therefore wealth. We work out this. Okay. In the 1950s, the advent of hygienic food storage and management of preventative diseases a platform for an incredible increase in population. You can see where the Malthusian prophecy was published back around the 1800s. Um, we are currently seven times the population of when Malthus um, uh, made his determination. <coughs> the capacity to feed the population was achieved with similar increases in crop productivity. For example, wheat yields in Mexico, Pakistan and India tripled during the same period <coughs> due to the work largely of Norman Borlaug and others who created the Green Revolution. The law of diminishing returns was overcome by technological progress. But Malthus may well be correct to the observation that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power of the earth to promote, produce subsistence for man. Quite right, in a sense. Compound growth is not mathematically or biologically possible with finite resources. Gravity wins most arguments. To put the challenge into perspective, global food demand for the next 50 years is expected to exceed the total food consumption for the previous 500 years. <coughs> so we've been able to condense 10 into 1. The food crisis of the 1960s was largely about skills and technology, but offset by generous sharing of R&D. The impending crisis involves most of the factors of production, food, land, land, water, nutrients, technology and skills. And add to that the various views on climate change. So, what are the main risks? Firstly, we'll talk about overpopulation. And secondly, a lack of diversity. Overpopulation. Let's be clear. Is lack of food and water the problem? Well, they're really symptoms, are they not? Overpopulation is the problem. It's about relativity. Economic growth propelled by population is, dare I use the term, a subprime strategy, a population Ponzi scheme. All Ponzi schemes <coughs> fail at some point in time and there is yet to be a palatable Ponzi unravelling. 
in a sense, it's not dissimilar to a cancer, this population surgery if we're observing a malignant tumour that multiplies in an uncontrollable manner until it destroys its host. Overpopulation is the elephant in the room. There's a little cartoon there with a, actually an elephant. Um, I'm not an artist, but they're my words. And they focused on quarterly growth, ignored dilution per capita of finite resources, and said we would live happily ever after. At some stage in the near future, mankind will recognise that with human rights come obligations for mankind. The long-term power capacity of the world has been estimated to be around 3.5 billion people, or roughly half where we are presently. The Easter Island experience is an awful alternative. Let's move on from population to the lack of diversity. And there's a number of points here. We'll start off with genetic diversity. It's estimated that more than half the world's food varieties have vanished over the last 100 years. For example, the number of corn varieties, if we can, excuse me, uh, corn up here, 307 varieties 100 years ago, now that has come down to 12. Um, as one example. Why is this significant? Well, let's consider wheat, which is the leading source of vegetable protein in human food. Wheat and stem rust have been involved in a steep battle since the Neolithic period some 8,500 years ago. In 1999, a fast mutating virulent stem rust was discovered in Uganda. Most of you have probably heard of it. It's UG99. Um, it then spread to Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan and Yemen. By 2007, it jumped the Gulf into Iran um, and is predicted to move into the bread baskets of India, Pakistan, then Russia and China. Australia, which trades 20% of the world's ocean-borne wheat, is in the direct path of westerly weather patterns from Africa <coughs> that can capably carry spores. Around 90% of the world's wheat varieties are defenceless against this fungus. In Asia and Africa alone, the portion of wheat in imminent danger would leave around 1 billion people without their primary staple food supply. Fungicides, of course, will assist producers who A, can access supply, and B, afford the price. Can you imagine what that would be in that situation? Um, however, this example highlights how critical it is to find ways to increase food yield without further eroding the limited genetic base which produces industrial agriculture's apparent um, abundance. The irony is that the dwindling genetic diversity of our food supply is the unanticipated consequence of Norman Borwald's rust resistant varieties that helped India and Pakistan increase production to the extent around a billion people have been saved from starvation. Whether it's wheat, corn, the eyes of brown chicken, large white pig or Holstein cow, the focus on production has unwittingly amplified the risk of food shortages in the future. Maintaining diversity of locally cultivated varieties of yesteryear is paramount to secure the, world, the world's food future. We'll move on to another diversity issue, and in this case, it's one of our key inputs. Let's focus on phosphate supply. Why is phosphate important? Well, you know it's the most important nutrient for plant growth. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. Its tonnages have gone from increased fivefold in 50 years up to 40 million tonnes per annum. If you can see that sort of slightly busy overhead there, that is grain tonnes on a vertical axis and years across the, the horizontal. Um, and you can see that when phosphate was introduced um, back through here, in conjunction with more technology, weed killers and fungicides um, and nitrogen and potash, um, crop yields increased, they tripled, in fact, in about 25 years. The UN estimates sufficient phosphate reserves for three to 400 years. So concerns about peak phosphate are probably premature at this point in time. However, 85% of the world's phosphate reserves are located in Morocco. As David Archibald alluded to in his presentation, um, the issue of phosphate scarcity is not from over, from resource over exploitation, but scarcity of supply due to sovereign risk or instability. 
Investment Bank, Nomura, rates Morocco as the world's second most vulnerable nation in terms of food inflation. By comparison, these names will be familiar to you. Egypt was rated 6, Libya 16, Tunisia 18. It is the supply of inputs that is risky, not necessarily the scarcity. Disruption of global phosphate supply would have an effect on grain production not dissimilar to a virulent pathogen decimating wheat production. I'll just touch on another important area of diversity which hasn't been mentioned this morning and I know there's a paper this afternoon, and that is a lack of diversity at retail level in this country. Lack of diversity at the retail end of the food chain is as important as erosion of genetic diversity at the production level. Um, and that's all I'll say on that. Um, I'd love a whole session on it. Um, but the, look, the view from the rear vision mirror is clearer than out the windscreen. So let's now look out the windscreen and turn to some opportunities. There's a couple of um, issues I'd like to talk about here on a micro scale, such as wastage and urban agriculture. And then we'll move on to macro scale um, with biotechnology um, and some research and development. Of course, opportunities is another word for human ingenuity or for innovation. Let's start with wastage. Before we explore ways to produce more, let's discuss how we can do better with what we already have produced. The world is hemorrhaging nutrients, water, energy and food at every stage in the link between farm and four. The Stockholm Institute calculates that 2,600 out of 4,600 fewer calories of food harvested is wasted. We've heard stats around that level um, this morning. That's an incredible 56% of food produced, or the equivalent to feed 3 billion people. Then, of course, there is the wastage associated with greed, which is leading to the diabetes of the economic, uh, beg your pardon, epidemic. Here, treasure. Um, so, this is food waste from a supermarket. Why is there so much wastage? Well, there's many reasons, of course, including food being so affordable, it's cheap, and households and businesses have little incentive not to waste. Price is a great invisible hand. They frequently buy more than necessary because it's better to be safe than sorry. Economies of scale, of course, drive global food production and transport costs. And while distant production might be cheaper, growing locally can produce less waste. And I think Rob Warburton touched on that this morning. The low hanging fruit for producing food waste is to increase food supply is blatantly obvious. And there are simple methods to reduce waste. For example, expiry dates are outdated. A large proportion of wasted food <coughs> passes its expiry date in supermarkets but remains fresh and edible. The reason is that food processors have little control over the temperatures their products are exposed to throughout the supply chain. Therefore, expiry dates are commonly brought forward as a risk mitigation strategy and edible food is disposed of. Time Temp, for example, is a Norwegian innovation that, um, predict, that shows self, a shelf life indicator um, that helps remedy in substantial and low cost ways uh, supermarket retail waste. Another way to reduce waste is to grow one's own food. And we'll move on here to the <coughs> micro opportunity, which is urban agriculture. Quite a low tech solution, but I believe one that's very effective. During World War II, around 40% of America's produce came from household gardens. <coughs> Suburban sprawl creates food waste because as distance from a supermarket increases, larger quantities of food are purchased, and therefore more food goes to waste in the home before it can be eaten. The opportunity to alleviate hunger with urban agriculture is enormous, as half the world's population live in cities, and one third of the world's hungry also live in cities. Urban farmers contribute to food security by increasing the amount of fresh food available to local residents, um, but they also reduce energy consumption from food transport and enhance genetic diversity by not adopting uh, monoculture varieties. <coughs> Move on now to opportunities and in particular technology at the macro scale. The human mind offers the greatest opportunities but also, unfortunately, the greatest obstacles to progress. In the broad acre context, it takes around 20 years for research to progress from concept to being commercialised and adopted by farmers. Conventional, conventional productivity methods clearly seem unable to keep pace with population growth. 
the obvious solution then would seem to be a greater use of technology, and that includes biotechnology. Here, some people and segments of the media have become alarmed, but let's be aware that genetic selection has been the basis of all evolution. And who better to quote here than Charles Darwin? It's not the strongest nor the most intelligent of creatures that survive, but the ones most able to adapt to change. And adapt we must. Some of the world's consumers, of course, prefer their, their food organic, assuming they have sufficient food supply. Look, it's great to be in a position to pay more to buy fresh vegetables grown by nice people farming nearby. Um, and I, for example, have the great pleasure with my own urban agriculture of a, of a vegetable garden and hens for eggs. It's wonderful when they lay and our landfill waste has been hard. But if it's necessary to produce the maximum amount of food for the lowest cost, does it make sense for the aesthetic preference of vocal middle class foodies to be elevated to a moral imperative? <coughs> I think not. But this is not a modern phenomenon. In about 100 AD, the Roman slave come philosopher Epictetus said, preach not to others what they should eat, but eat as becomes, you, as becomes you and be silent. Wise words indeed. And as farmers grappled with complex technical issues to increase food production, segments of society seem to view food supply as an ethical and social one. There needs to be some convergence on food for this food security issue to progress. To bring some clarity, and perhaps a circuit breaker to the table, let's dispose of the broad brush approach and investigate Carl Nielsen's classification scheme uh, for genetic modification. Up here we can see that um, intragenic and phagogenic <coughs> methods of genetic modification are actually possible within the genome and family with conventional breeding, okay? The other three um, <coughs> methods are impossible, and that's the hor horizontal gene transfer that a lot of, um, <coughs> causes a lot of, the, um, um, a lot of the debate. It would seem reasonable, would it not, that given the almost certain inevitability of global famine from UG99 or some other uh, pathogen, that intragenic and phagogenic methods, <coughs> pardon me, of plant breeding to be encouraged broaden the genetic base of mainstream crops in preparedness for pathogen attack. Change refers to improvement, not any individual's view of perfection. I appeal for the debate to be confined to those methods where conventional breeding is not possible. The media frequently publishes polar opinions, which may sell newspapers, but is not especially conducive to value accretive change. Such practices generate heat when what we need is light. The advantage of intragenesis is it can be used to create new varieties of crops more quickly, more cost effectively, and with more certainty compared with conventional breeding. And importantly, only target beneficial genes are selected with no loss of desirable traits, which is a problem with conventional back cost breeding. For example, this is potatoes here. We've got Phytophthora resistant <coughs> potato in between rows of conventional varieties which are um, as you can see with it, and will uh, produce very little yield. The potato is a prescient example. Imported into Europe from Peru in the 1700s, the Irish were almost totally dependent upon the lump of variety for their food staple. In 1845, Phytophthora fungus spread across Ireland, and nearly all the lumpers were destroyed, and the resulting famine killed or displaced millions. Um, in fact, over 20% of the population Never mind the politics of that, the British are still exporting food from us. Let's not go there. Um, it would seem that such advances in mainstream crops would be appropriate, in fact overdue, to de-risk global food supplies and achieve greater output of food per unit of fertiliser and energy um, uh, employed. Also, reducing the requirement for pesticides and fungicides, I would suggest, is an added advantage. <coughs> just quote Galileo here in the 1500s I do not feel obliged to believe the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason and intellect has intended us to forego their use with intragenesis there is no foreign DNA inserted which addresses some of the arguments against biotech such as horizontal gene transfer and allergies 
a legitimate issue with such breeding is that varieties are commonly subject to patents. Most existing crop varieties are covered by plant variety protection, which allows farmers and public researchers uh, to save seed from year to year. However, if having a choice uh, of improved varieties, even with patents, assists in reducing black swan risks, then it would seem prudent to not obstruct production or market access of such varieties. Events like Global UG99 are catastrophic, not unpredictable. We've had ample warning uh, and ample inaction. UG99 is an example of an external pressure point that will require magnitude <coughs> change. We must not continue to put our head in the sand. I'll just move on to um, this quote from Jonathan Swift. This predated Malthus by about three quarters of a century. And he gave it for his opinion that whosoever could make two ears of corn or two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before would deserve better of mankind and do more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians <laughs> put together. <laughs> yeah. um, so, we can use more land, or we can use more technology, or we can use technology to actually use less land. Speaking of land, the USDA, in fact, estimates some 90 million hectares of savannah in uh, Brazil are available for uh, cultivation without deforestation. Now, that's the equivalent to the entire cultiv cultivated area of the USA. Um, so, we do have a choice whether we can turn that into homogenous uh, agriculture or whether it can be left uh, and biodiversity enhanced. And I'll use this as an example. The left hand, or the critical <coughs> column here, is the area in hectares going back to 1960. Um, it's a percentage change in areas from 1960. For example, in South Asia, um, the production has increased threefold from 1960, with only a 20% increase in land use. Clearly, it's all been due um, the view has been due to technology adoption. Conversely, sub-Saharan Africa, there's been a similar increase in output over that same period, but um, yield has increased relatively modestly, but it's been the doubling of pressure on land resources over that time. If, if protection of natural environments, <coughs> biodiversity and survival of other species, um, who said we don't speak of the environment in, in this room? Um, is important, then technology is essential. Clearly, production systems impact land use. This is a air um, seeding machine up there where I come from. No production system is perfect. All have some impact on the, on the environment. And the issue is not whether plant nutrition is industrial or organic, as plants can only absorb inorganic forms of nutrients. It's the battle for weed control where organic broadacre production presents a challenge in Australia. For example, organic weed control relies substantially on tillage. In contrast to one-pass no-till crop establishment uh, such as this, multiple tillage operations to control weeds causes increased soil compaction, loss of structure, and higher risks of wind and water erosion. Time of sowing penalties causes substantial yield reduction, which in the Australian context around three times as much land is required to produce the same quantity of organic grain as conventional grain. So land use is a choice, and so is conservation. And I think we can use technology to further those ends. I'll move on to some uh, cutting edge R&D in the WA wheat belt, where our crop rotation is lupin, wheat, canola, wheat. Uh, my colleague, Craig Topham, has for a number of years been refining this research which converges Paddock soil mapping with a, a, a wheat product, a predictive um, computer program which deals with water availability, probabilities, and nitrogen applications. So, what, what does it achieve? Higher paddock yields from the same or fewer inputs, better return on funds employed, fully automated implementation, and a reduced risk for the farm business through improved profit, and therefore less risk for the financier, and an ability to provide financiers, who are the major partners of many businesses in WA, with up-to-date information on crop prospects, objectively, I should say. Okay, 
we use electromagnetic and radiometric scans, and this particular vehicle comes from Esperance, which is the opposite end of the state, um, to target soil testing sites, which measure the three components of risk and productivity, water holding capacity, soil pH, and potash. Once we have a map of those three drivers, we're seriously in business. And that map goes down to a metre in depth, and uh, you can see a soil core um, result there as well. Okay, we established paddock zones, which is that uh, bottom right slide there. Bottom left is the yield map, and those red circles on the left are where we've determined soil testing sites to determine nutrition. Um, inputs are fully automated through intractor controllers throughout the growing season and can be varied with the farmer and emailed to them within 10 minutes. So in real time, during the, during the growing season, we can continually monitor and update um, the uh, nitrogen applications, which are then a major, um, a major opportunity. <coughs> then what we have is this program called Yield Profit, which is, um, has been uh, developed over many years in Australia. It's a fantastic tool. Um, and what we can see here, <coughs> pardon me, down the left-hand side we've got probability. So a decile, uh, a decile eight season, which is the wettest 8%, uh, uh, wet, wettest 20% of seasons. And then you can see the yield in tonnes per hectare across the horizontal axis. So with the actual yield with applied nitrogen to that particular date when this reading was taken, there's a, um, that's the probability. However, if uh, nitrogen was non-limiting, then you've got a greater slope in the graph. And at the start, at seeding, that, that gradient is greater. As you get closer to harvest, of course, it's more predictable. Um, and as you get closer to harvest, we've got a better idea whether we're running on a decile one year or a decile nine year up here. And this is some data from this season. That, um, <coughs> so we've got three zones there. Top left, high input, you can see a lot higher biomass there. The middle one is the average that used to be applied to the whole farm um, in the olden days, about 12 months ago. Um, and zone three was the low input, as you can see, it's quite a sparse crop there. This gives us more power. This is the holy grail of broad acre wheat production uh, in Western Australia. I believe this technology will be on all farms of substance in this state, probably within, I would say definitely within the next five years. Um, one of the panel speakers from Esperance this morning mentioned adopting research. Well, um, and not doing it too early. We know the pioneers get the arrows and the settlers get the land. Um, this is past the pioneer stage. This is definitely settler environment. Um, and of course, the reason that we're doing this and the reason that moisture is so critical is that plants die first here for those from overseas, definitely not old age. Um, we record gross margins by each soil zone, and um, this is just a little gross margin chart. Oops, sorry. Um, this is a gross margin chart here. We've got gross margins in dollars per hectare uh, for treatment one, or zone one, zone two, zone three, and then we've got different N, P, and K rates um, for each one of those, each one of those zones. We run test trips <coughs> across each zone every year. So we're constantly validating our input assumptions. And um, uh, it, as, again, at risk of repetition, this is extraordinary. Um, <coughs> I might just move on now to, um, I mentioned at the start, agriculture's greatest opportunity. Agriculture in Australia, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, has a public relations challenge which is affecting its future. For example, if you were a school student, would you spend four years at university studying a degree when your friend's perception of, you, of your future employer or client is a financially challenged farmer, blaming seasons and prices for business failure, angling for taxpayer relief? <coughs> I don't think it's stay that course. The privatise the game, socialise the pain image is as destructive for the industry as it is for the soul. And take note, less than a handful of agricultural science graduates 
came from the University of Western Australia in Perth last year. This is critical because the gap between the top 10% of farm businesses and the rest continues to widen. My role as a management consultant is to connect clients' biological, financial and human performance. And from my perspective, the difference is almost entirely due to management, the ability or effectiveness of determining and implementing strategies and being able to change them as better information comes to And it's time for the top 10% of farmers, and I include everybody in this room, it's time to stand up. You must communicate the virtues and successes of your industry and your business to attract the smartest young minds. And this is a global issue. Despite agriculture's contribution to society, for example, a 300% increase in production in 40 years from a 12% increase in arable area, how many Nobel Prize recipients are from agriculture? Norman Borlaug, are there any others? None that springs to mind. On a daily basis, I'm inspired by farmers, by their ingenuity, by their incredible powers of observation, and by their ability to succeed against odds that at times seem insurmountable. I could not contemplate a more rewarding career. The near future will be unlike anything we have experienced before. There will be more volatility and amplified risk. What will happen when there is UG99 globally or zero days to fire grain? Will, will the seed be eaten? It is much easier to plan successfully if we accept inevitabilities. And there is no fairy dogma. And one more thing, hope <coughs> is not a strategy. Hope, like denial, is an opiate, a sedative causing inaction. Will you waste your Nuffield investment and be a hand wringing opiate? Or will you engage in solving significant problems to the level of thought above that which created them? I urge you to lead, be positive, and give direction. Lord Nuffield would expect this from you.